Hello everyone, I am Be Better Gamer. Welcome to my YouTube channel where I do Let's Plays of WWF No Mercy, WCW NW Revenge, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, the very best wrestling games ever made. Sometimes I sprinkle in a few other things, but those are the games that I try to play the most. Today I have a very special episode. So as I record this today, it's July 13th, 2015. And 18 years ago, WCW presented Bash at the Beach 1997. Can you believe that? 18 years ago. WCW NW Revenge came out in October of 98. So that's 17 years ago. Um, it's it's insane. I'm, I'm dating myself right now because I played this game when I was younger, when I was a kid. And um, I thought it'd be great to revisit that pay-per-view mainly because... The Bash at the Beach arena that you can choose in WCW NW Revenge is modeled after the Bash at the Beach 97. Uh, many people might remember Bash at the Beach 96. It was the historic event in, w in WCW and in wrestling when Hulk Hogan turned on everyone. He turned on the whole world. Okay, Hulkamania all of a sudden went bad. He went heel and he became a member of the NWO, joining Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, who defected from WWE. Not really defected, they just, you know, signed a bigger, better contract with WCW. But that's how they made the storyline seem. They defected from WWF and they wanted to take WCW, shake it up turn it upside down and take over and the NWO was created. That was Bash at the Beach 96. Flash forward to Bash at the Beach 97. Maybe not as historic and trend setting and, and changing the fate of wrestling as we would know it, but Bash at the Beach 90, 96 did have some significant moments. So much like my WrestleMania 2000 uh, memories video, I'm going to go through the pay-per-view. I'm going to do the matches that I can. I can't do every match perfectly recreated like it was on the pay-per-view because not all the characters are in the game yada yada but I'm gonna go through the matches that I can and while I play some WCW NW Revenge I will talk about Bash at the Beach 97 and reflect at a much younger time in my life when I watch wrestling and and maybe not know as much as I know now and discuss all the different facts and fun trivia that I've learned from that pay-per-view since watching it. I re-watched it again recently to kind of refresh my memory. You can watch it on the WWE Network if you don't have it. Go get it. It's a great resource for things like this if you want to reflect and see if things are as good as you remember them. And chances are they're not. <laughs> but nonetheless, we're going to have some fun. So the first match, I'm playing as Mortis and Glacier. Now, Mortis is actually Chris Canyon. And Canyon is an unlockable character in WCW NW Revenge. You have to beat the TV title championship in order to unlock him. Canyon was never the TV title champion. He only held the WCW tag team title uh, while he was there along with Diamond Dallas Page when they were part of the Jersey Triad. And this was way after uh, NWO, WCW NW Revenge came out. But his first... Well, not really his first gimmick because he, he was Canyon briefly when he first made his appearance in WCW. But then he was rebranded as Mortis, who was the uh, mortal, you know, sworn enemy of Glacier. They had some sort of history that we didn't know about that was going to be revealed to us. And Glacier, having just been, um, I would say, what year did he make his debut? He made his debut in Nitro, on Nitro. Uh, September 96, defeating Big Bubba Rogers, aka Big Boss Man. And he was going through this whole year from September of 96 up until the Bash to the Beach. He was undefeated. No one could beat Glacier in a singles match. And uh, Mortis was introduced to be his rival. And Mortis was calling in reinforcements, aka Wrath, who was Brian Clark to help him take down the unstoppable Glacier. So when it became two against one, when it became Mortis and Wrath going up against Glacier, Glacier had some help by uh, Ernest the Cat Williams, who made his debut in June of 97, one month before the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view. He came into the company to save Glacier. So that set the, the you know stage for Glacier and Ernest the Cat Miller versus Wrath and Mortis. Now, Wrath wasn't in WCW NW Revenge officially, but he was being made to be put in the game. And if you have a Game Shark,
you can enter a code that unlocks Wrath. Basically, he's an unfinished character. They have his face, they have his taunts, they have his moveset. Some of his moves don't make a sound, which is interesting. Shows you how much... Um, it shows. It gives you a little insight of how the game is designed. They had to design the moves to have sounds, and I guess they had to do it individually per character and wrestler. I don't know if later on they changed it. Maybe they did because that's when they had it. They create a wrestler mode, you know, imported. But you had to. Uh, but he didn't have his costume. He starts out with a sting outfit. So if you unlock him with the Game Shark, he'll disappear if you turn off the cartridge. So you would have to enter it again. If you want to keep Wrath as part of your roster, you have to win a title with Wrath, and then you have to go in, do the same title as anyone, and beat Wrath. And you sort of unlock him like you would unlock any of the other wrestlers when you first open the game. And um, there's several wrestlers to unlock in the championship path. So Wrath technically is in the game, but he's hidden. Uh, Ernest the Cat Miller wasn't put in the game. I don't know why. You know, when I was doing research for this video, there's a lot of people on this pay-per-view. And this is, you know, July of 1997. So WCW NWO World Tour hasn't even come out yet. It comes out at the end of the year, September 97. But when we get to October 98... A lot of these guys that are in the pay-per-view were still wrestling quite frequently in WCW. And it makes you kind of wonder, well, why weren't they included in the game? There's a whole, like, two stables of wrestlers uh, that are, many people think they're, like, fake wrestlers. I mean, they are fake wrestlers. You got, you got Shogun and the Executioner, AKA, AKI Man. And all these wrestlers are actually, with the exception of AKI Man, all these wrestlers are actually modeled off of Japanese wrestlers. I think they kept the moveset of these Japanese wrestlers that they used in Virtual Pro Wrestling 64, who are real wrestlers. You know, you're talking about guys like Kenta Kobashi, Akira Tahu, Toshiaka Kawada. And they just gave them these fake skins, these made-up character personas, and they kept them in the game. Now, to me... Looking back at the roster of WCW from 97 to 98, there was a lot of guys they could have put in there instead of having these fake wrestlers. Maybe there wasn't enough time, and maybe Wrath was kind of an example of that. Uh, he was this wrestler who was part of the roster, but for whatever reason, they didn't have enough time to finish him. And But I don't know. It would be great uh, if I could somehow get in contact with one of like the head designers of one of, this, one of these games and, and talk about the actual you know, dealings of what went on, of, of who got to go in, and why they had to use these, you know, fake wrestlers with actual movesets, you know, if, if, if it was a thing where they didn't have enough time to develop actual character models based off of exis existing WCW wrestlers, because Ernest the Cat Miller, when he came in to WCW, he was winning all the time. I mean, the dude was pretty much undefeated for a while, and, you know, Glacier got to go in, Mortis got to go in. Wrath almost made it in. So why didn't Ernest the Cat Miller make it in? I don't know. I would love to. If anyone knows of anyone who made these games, let me know. I would love to find out what was the case. But yeah. So um, this tag match, it was it was Glacier, Ernest the Cat Miller against Wrath and Mortis. Uh, Glacier would lose along with Ernest the Cat. Mortis would would get the pin, I believe. And uh, that was the first time. Glacier had lost in a match. It wasn't a singles loss, but it was still a loss in a tag match. He would occur his first singles match loss against Buff Bagwell in September of 97, so almost a full year after his debut. That's when Glacier would lose. And um, like I said in the beginning, this this feud was really this match was really built up about the ongoing rivalry between the arrival of Mortis and Glacier, and they supposed to have some secret history but we never really found out that history uh, because shortly after this pay-per-view match this feud would fizz out and they would stop feuding Mortis would still be wrestling as Mortis for a little bit but when he would try to join Raven's flock uh, Raven told Mortis hey go beat DDP he couldn't beat DDP and then that's when he became he went back to being Canyon and he you know joined Raven's flock didn't join Raven's flock. It was all a ruse. 
and then he went back to join anyway. It was very, it gets very complicated with Canyon after that, but I mean, I guess that's all you really need to know. Mortis doesn't stay in Mortis for too long, and Glacier, Glacier, he doesn't stay in WCW too long either. Ernest the Cat Miller stays there for a while, and Brian Clark stays there for a while too. I, I believe he stays there up until the very end. So here we go. The next match we got. Uh, on the card was actually Chris Jericho against Ultimate Dragon for the WCW Cruiserweight title. Uh, Chris Jericho was the reigning Cruiserweight champion. And uh, on this pay-per-view, Ultimate Dragon was called the Ultimate Dragon. Uh, it, it's a very weird thing. So this pay-per-view was July of 97 and Ultimate Dragon made his debut at Hogwild 96. and So that was almost a full year before this pay-per-view. and. Every other week, it seemed like they kept going back and forth. Are we going to call him Ultimate Dragon? Or are we going to call him Ultimo Dragon? You know, his his persona was Ultimo Dragon. That's what he became when he went to Mexico. He put on the mask and he became Ultimo Dragon. And in Japan, he was named Ultimo Dragon. And when you get this game, he's called Ultimo Dragon. And today, everyone knows him as Ultimo Dragon. For some reason, they wanted to call him Ultimate Dragon in WCW. I don't know why. Um, the ultimate isn't the English translation of Ultimo. Ultimo means last. Uh, so he was the last dragon. Uh, ultimate is not the last. Ultimate is like, you know, the best, the super. Uh, very interesting stuff, but he was Ultimate Dragon at this pay-per-view. Nonetheless, if you've never seen this match, go watch this match. Uh, classic, classic match. I loved it. You know, I, I'm surprised I didn't remember this match. I really didn't. I didn't really remember this match, and when I rewatched it, this is just one of the many examples of Ultimate Dragon and Chris Jericho having a classic match. Ultimate Dragon is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Definitely my favorite character to play as in WCW, uh, NWO Revenge. Chris Jericho, probably my second favorite character to play as in WCW, NWO Revenge. But. You know, Ultimate Dragon was already cruiserweight and TV title reign within his first year as WCW, and he also appeared when he was the J Crown champion. Um, and Jericho, he, uh, him, and Ultimate Dragon had sort of a rivalry before they even got to WCW, because they spent several years together in a Japanese promotion called War, which was Wrestle and Romance. <laughs> You gotta love those Japanese names. Uh, so they they fought quite a bit, and um, actually Jericho was the War International Junior Heavyweight Champion at one point, and him and Ultimate Dragon had a match at one of War's big uh, shows, uh, almost like a pay per view, but you wouldn't really call it a pay per view, but nonetheless one of their bigger shows of the year, and it was that match that Jericho credits to him being noticed by sort of the you know the high brass in ECW and WCW and his tape got floated around and that's what kind of opened the doors for him to come to ECW and then eventually WCW was his match against Ultimate Dragon and I would imagine also what helped put Ultimate Dragon over too is that they wanted to add him to help diversify their cruiserweight division and they had a lot of other mask wrestlers and luchadors and Japanese wrestlers running around and this is a match that pretty much resembles of just how great they were always in the ring. Ultimate Dragon and Chris Jericho would meet many times in WCW, and they fought many times before this, and I've seen a dozen of their matches, which is why I probably don't remember a single one vividly, but they, they all kind of like blend together. And they, but it's so good, you know what I mean? It's like a really good blend of just classic matches. Um, yeah, it's... it's it's interesting too because Ultimate Dragon, he's fighting for the Cruiserweight title here and he would win the TV title two weeks later on Nitro on July 22nd. So I, I've done a Ultimate Dragon TV title run. You can check that on my channel already where I talk a little bit about his time as TV title champion and how a lot of the Cruiserweights sort of hit this grass ceil glass ceiling in WCW and, and this match is kind of reflective of that because these guys are going out there probably giving the best match of the card in my opinion, in terms of in-ring wrestling work. But this was still early Babyface Jericho. He hadn't really found his voice. 
or at least been allowed to speak his voice just yet in WCW and Ultimate Dragon being one of the many mask wrestlers never really even got the mic. I can't even really remember a time when they gave Ultimate Dragon the mic. Uh, at one point he would be man, you know, originally he was managed by Sonny Ono and he, and even Sonny Ono, he wasn't the great the greatest on the mic, more of like a little bit of a comic comic relief manager, but Ultimate Dragon was no joke in the ring. I mean Ultimate Dragon Innovator of many moves, the Asai Moonsault, the Dragon Kanrana, the Running Liger Bomb. Even though everyone calls it the Running Liger Bomb, it's actually the Dragon Bomb. Uh, Ultimate Dragon innovated that. Uh, he did the Dragon Sleeper, which was innovated by Tatsubi Fujinami. Uh, Ultimate Dragon's just all around. I love Ultimate Dragon. I could, I could talk for days about Ultimate Dragon, and I will. I will talk for days. You'll probably see a lot of Ultimate Dragon videos on my channel. I know I got a Cruiserweight Ultimate Dragon run coming up. Uh, Ultimate Dragons in Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, another video I fit you on this channel. I, as a hidden character, I would definitely play as him. And Jericho, Jericho's one of the few people who's actually been in most of the AKI developed games. I mean, he wasn't in the Virtual Pro 64 or Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, but he was in Revenge, No Mercy, and uh, WrestleMania 2000. One of the few wrestlers who has the benefit of being in both the WCW and WWF games. But yeah, this is a great match. Go watch this match. Fantastic match. Um, I just can't... I, I, I really I really could go for days analyzing the match. But unfortunately, there were some matches on this pay-per-view that I can't recreate because some of the characters in the game. So I guess while I have this opportunity of Chris Jericho trying to get the win over Ultimate Dragon, he's putting up quite a fight. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Steiners against Great Muda and Masa Chono. That was the next match on the card. So the Steiners are in the game, obviously, Rick and Scott Steiner. Uh, at this point, they were still teaming up together as the Steiner brothers. This was before the Scott Steiner heel turn, where he betrayed his brother and joined the NWO. Uh, but Scott Steiner and Rick Steiner were on the hunt for the tag team titles that they felt you know, they, they lost to... Scott Hall and Nash, uh, they, they shouldn't have lost it pretty much, that they were the ba best tag team in WCW, and Hall and Nash were pretty much ducking them for their rematch, for the number one contenders match, so they always kept weaseling their way out of a straight up, you know, tag team championship match again, and Great Muda and Master Chono were representing NWO Japan, so the Steiners had to kind of get through Great Muda and Master Chono before they could qualify for the number one contendership. Which they would get at Hog Wild, and they would, I believe, beat Hall and Nash at Hog Wild for the tag team titles. Uh, Muda and Chono were both former NWA champions, and that was mentioned briefly in the match. The match is a really good match. Watch that match too. So I'm gonna recommend all the matches you should watch and you shouldn't watch while I go through this. You could skip the uh, the first match, the tag team match, unless you're, you're a really big fan of Glacier. I know there's a lot of big fans of Glacier. Um, but the Steiners versus Muda and Masa Chono, really good match. Muda and Chono were former NWA champions. Uh, briefly gets mentioned by Mike Tanay, I believe. Um, and, and that's it. They don't even talk about that. No mention of how big of a deal that great Muda is part of NWA Japan since this turn hadn't really fully materialized over in Japan. See, the NWO is sort of based on... And I've talked about this in my... Virtual Pro Wrestling Let's Play videos because right now I'm doing a run in the story mode as Masahiro Chono and Chono, Tenzan, and uh, Masa Seto were uh, originators of this group called Team Wolf which would eventually be called Team 2000 and also be known as NWO Japan and that's where the NWO idea kind of came from this renegade group of three guys who were taking over the company and slowly absorbing turning other guys and they were trying to destroy the company from within so Great Muda and uh, or Keje Muto and Masa Chono always had this long rivalry because they both debuted at the same time, they both trained at the same time, and from the get go, they were both seen as two of the top new rising stars in New Japan Pro Wrestling. When Masa Chono went heel uh, and was trying to convert Keje Muto over to join his team, uh, Keje Muto wouldn't do it. So they would beat him up, they would beat Kenzuki Sasaki up, they would beat all the New Japan heroes up. 
For the longest time, KJ Muto was teasing that he was going to turn. Will he turn? Will he not turn? Then he started showing up as the Great Muda, his alternate persona. And the Great Muda was teaming along NWO Japan and Team 2000 and Chono and those guys. But then, like, two weeks later, he'd wrestle as KJ Muto and wrestle against NWO Japan. And then uh, KJ Muto would tease that he still was going to join NWO Japan, but then Great Muda was teasing how he was going to betray NWO Japan. It was very, it was, it was getting very complicated, and uh, but eventually uh, Great Muda would officially join NWO Japan, also cementing Keje Muda turning over to NWO Japan, and that would be the, the start of Muda and Chono becoming this very dominant tag team in New Japan, that full turn hadn't quite happened yet. So it was still a big, like, wow, Great Muda is wrestling with NWO Japan, but what about Keje Muto? Uh, no mention of that in the pay-per-view, and why should they? Because uh, Muto and, J- and Chono were only there for a few matches in the summer. Uh, Chono would reappear briefly in 98 for some matches with Tenzan, actually, while they were the IWGP Tag Team Champions. Uh, and then he would come back again in July of 98 and wrestle with Muda for one match. And his final appearance would be in 2000, uh, in January of 2000, where him and Super J wrestled against Mike Rotunda and Rick Steiner. Great Muda, uh, he had that brief stint in 97 at this time, came back for that one appearance with Chono in 98. And he wouldn't return until 2000, and he actually kind of had a significant run in that him and Vampiro started teaming up, and they became the WCW Tag Team Champions. So, but it was a good match. Go watch it. Steiners versus Muda and Chono. They've also wrestled a bunch of times in Japan, and they got some good matches from wrestling over the Tokyo Dome and stuff like that. So, so then we move on to the trios match. So right now I'm playing as Juventud Guerrera, and I'm taking on Sikosis, and this is sort of me representing the trios match that went on between Juventud Guerrera. Hector Garza and Lismark Jr., and they took on La Parca, Sakosis, and Villano 4. Now, this was a trios match, and a trios match is basically the, the Lucha Libre term for a six man tag. But a six man tag in Mexico follows different rules than what we know of here in a regular six man tag. So that's why it's called a trios match. Uh, guys don't really have to tag in and out. If let's say Juventud Guerrero is in the ring and Psychosum throws him outside, if he's thrown outside, then any one of his teammates could run in. So what this does, it creates the opportunity for a lot of high flying spots. A lot of guys going in and out of the ring, jumping out of the ring and jumping onto each other. A lot of missed spots because these guys work these trios match so, lo- so much that they are supposed to know what the other person is going to do. So that creates a lot of opportunities for like missed spots. Like, oh, he went for a high flying move, but it was countered, this and that. They can be very exciting, creates a lot of diversity, gives a lot of guys opportunities opportunities to team up with guys they normally wouldn't team up with and it's always very clear cut you have the tech the, the, the technos and the rudos and you know basically the heels and the baby faces and um the Juventu Guerrero represents the technicos and the psychosis represents the rudos so um this was another occasion where i was looking at this match and i was like huh why weren't any of these uh luchadors included in revenge and some of them wrestled briefly in WCW around 97, 98, but some of them more so than others. But I always like to look at British Bulldog and Jim Nyhart's time in WCW because I always thought it was strange that they were in the game because British Bulldog only wrestled from January of 98 to May of 98, and he didn't come back to September. So that's, you know, January, February, March, April, May. That's only five months. Again, uh, World Tour came out in November of 97, Revenge came out in October of 98, so you think about a year of development, but five months, and that qualifies British Bulldog for being in the game. Okay, I guess. Uh, Jim Neihardt, same deal. He wrestled from January to September of 98 every month, but he only had sporadic appearances, and mostly they were with British Bulldog. Um, Hector Garza, Lismark Jr., and Villano 4, they all had... Uh, more of a lengthy run than those two guys did. Uh, Hector Garza made his debut on Nitro on May 26th, so he made his debut that year, a few months before this pay-per-view, in a trios match. Uh, and he was pretty much active from May of 97 to December of 97. Um, in, in January of 98, 
He had a match, uh, a trios match with him, Rey Mysterio Jr. and Super Kahlo against La Parka, Psychosis, and Silver King. And then he disappeared until September of 98. So he was active for most of 97, but then he would disappear for all of 98. Alright, I could get why he wasn't in it. Okay, that makes sense. Now, Lismark Jr. Lismark Jr. made his debut on Nitro May, May 5th, 97. Uh, this Bash at the Beach trios match was Lismark Jr.'s second match at WCW and um, he wrestled pretty much two or three matches each month after that in 97 and 98 with the exception of December of 97 and then um, there was like a three month stint in, in 98 uh, from April, May, June that he didn't wrestle any matches so he definitely put in more time uh, if you look at the time that maybe uh, NWO World Tour and Revenge the time between those the development time uh, Lismark Jr. definitely put in more time than British Bulldog, but he doesn't get put in. Uh, Viano 4 is kind of the same deal. He made his debut way back in 96 uh, at World War 3, and uh, he would wrestle uh, briefly in 96, and he would come back at the beginning of 97, and he was pretty much active in, in 97, 98. I mean, I remember seeing the Vianos all the time. They lost a whole bunch. <laughs> I mean, they were pretty much like the Luchador, Luchador uh, jobbers. Um, but still, they were in it all the time. And, and you would think maybe they'd throw the Vianos in. I mean, that's an easy, that's an easy uh, palette swap. They could just keep them in the same... You know, character slot. They don't even have to make a whole new character slot for them. Just like how they did Chris Canyon and Mortis. You know, two different personalities, same move set. I mean, it's the same guy, but that was their whole shtick. They were brothers, but you couldn't tell them apart because they basically had the same body shape and they both wore masks. So how could you really tell which one was Viano Four, or which one was Viano Five? Um, and that's how they. Even in this match, it's supposed to be a trio match, and Viano Four is in it. But um, during the end of it, Viano Five tries to come in and. Uh, uh, go in and pretend he's Viano 4 while Viano 4 is hanging out on the side of the apron and the ref the ref can't tell the ref could probably tell barely tell any one of them apart <laughs> so um, why weren't the Vianos in revenge that's gonna be my, one my first question if I ever meet that developer of revenge <laughs> that's gonna be the first question so uh, nice to meet you nice for having me on this channel uh, why weren't the Vianos in WCW NW revenge could you please tell me that and then, you know, see what their response is. I, mean, I bet you I won't be surprised uh, <laughs> why they weren't in revenge. Uh, cause they, but still, that would have been neat instead of having the executioner and, you know, the Frankenstein looking guy. I'd rather have the Vianos. Um, I'd rather have the Vianos come in and um, so I could beat them up with the Steiner brothers all the time. That would have been great. Um, but yeah, you know, it would have been neat too to have a trios match in WCW and WWE Revenge. But we never quite got the six-man tag and any of the AKI developed games uh, you can do the six-man tags now in like the modern games WWE 2K15 you can do a six-man tag so if you ever want to recreate a trio style match you can definitely do so now in the modern games but unfortunately um, the N64 games never really pushed it that far who knows maybe if we ever did get that fabled sequel to No More Mercy that was supposed to come out maybe they would have done a six man tag I don't know if they could have fit more than four characters at the same time I guess we'll never know I mean that would be another great question to ask uh, one of the developers of these games would it have been possible to do a six man tag you know because then you could have definitely included all those luchadors and, and it had your trios matches like crazy uh, but yeah but the but the you know the technicals win Hoovertooth Guerrera, Hector Garza and um, Liz Mark Jr. Mike Tanay during this match says that how that was a, a really uh, big moment because it was kind of a dream match these second generation wrestlers coming together uh, all sons of big big wrestling stars in J in Mexico so Unfortunately, that kind of got lost on the American audiences over the years, but that's another episode. It's another discussion for another episode. Now, there's going to be one, two matches that we're going to skip real quick because we're going into the Scott Hall, Macho Man, Randy Savage versus Diamond Dallas Page and Kurt Henning match. But at Bash at the Beach 97, so the next match after the Trios match was Chris Benoit taking on the Taskmaster in a retirement match. Taskmaster was Kevin Sullivan, Sullivan, I should say. 
And um, this was a uh, this was a crazy feud because um, you know Chris Benoit was a member of the Horsemen and Taskmaster. I think I believe at this time the Dungeon. No, no, he still kind of had the Dungeon of Doom a little bit. But basically, Kevin Sullivan and Chris Benoit were feuding, and uh, Woman, aka Nancy Benoit. Uh, she was with the four horsemen and she was floating around with Chris Benoit on screen so Taskmaster was kind of upset saying that Chris Benoit had stolen her from him and in real life Kevin Sullivan and Nancy were married so in order to help sell the feud uh, publicly you know in real life uh, Chris Benoit and Nancy started traveling together and remember she was married to Taskmaster at this time so this actually turned up to being a real life affair because Nancy and Benoit actually started having a relationship while she was married to Kevin Sullivan and this led to them getting a divorce, Sullivan and Nancy. And Nancy uh, becoming engaged with Benoit after the divorce. This was all happening this year while this feud was going on and their feud went on for almost a year and this was the culmination of that feud, this, this, this retirement match and in real life. Uh, Chris Benoit ended up actually did having an affair with um, Kevin Sullivan's wife all because he wanted to have them travel together and actually have this feud. Kevin Sullivan was Booker at the time of WCW so he had complete creative control to to move this feud in the direction that he wanted to and he ended up booking his wife in an angle where he was where she was having an affair on him and she ended up having an affair on him so I don't know maybe he was just a big jerk and this was like a way of her getting her revenge on him maybe there was more to the story uh, of course when you talk about Chris Benoit and Nancy Benoit there's always more to the story but nonetheless Chris Benoit did say in his um, WWE DVD that you probably can't find on the WWE website uh, <laughs> that he uh, was always kind of grateful that Kevin Sullivan never um, you know, took out his own personal grievances on Benoit because Sullivan hated him, but he never took advantage of that fact in the ring. And this match was probably my second favorite match of the night of the pay-per-view because it's such a, like an old-school, rough, you know, no-holds-barred match. Chris Benoit and Kevin Sullivan beat the crap of, out of each other. It kind of slows down towards the end, but the crowd was hot. The crowd was really into it. Uh, I, I definitely remember this feud the most growing up. I remember when I was looking at the card and watching the matches, I, I remembered vividly the Chris Benoit having to face like Ming a bunch of times and Barbarian, uh, all the Dungeon of Doom people to sort of get his right to fight Kevin Sullivan. And then he finally got his chance to go up against Kevin Sullivan and, and get his revenge, but also put Kevin Sullivan in permanent retirement. And unlike most career ending matches, Sullivan stays retired. He doesn't come back out of retirement until um, Starcade 99 uh, for eight man tag match where the Varsity Club reunites in which Kevin Sullivan was an original uh, manager slash member of. But him, Jim Duggan, Mike Rotunda, and Rick Steiner, they took on Asia, Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, and Shane Douglas. So one match, you know, I, I guess I guess that still qualifies as him having a successful uh, career ending match in WCW. Um, so the next match after that was a U.S. heavyweight title match between Jeff Jarrett and Steve Mongo McMichael. Uh, never really a fan of either of these wrestlers, so I won't spend too much time on it. But I do have to note that Steve Mongo McMichael was another wrestler that was always weird why he wasn't included in the game. Uh, he made his debut at Great American Bash 96, and then he joined the Four Horsemen. And he was only inactive from March of 98 to May of 98. So only three months, all his whole time in WCW. Uh, don't know why he wasn't included in the game either. But uh, here we go. We got a tag team match between Macho Man, Scott Hall, against DDP and Kurt Enning. Now, the, this was a big deal, uh, or at least WCW tried to make it a big deal because DDP was feuding with the NWO and Macho Man at this time. And they were giving him a rough time, and he had no allow uh, allegiances because everyone was joining the NWO. And Kurt Henning had shown up at WCW, and that was big because he was Mr. Perfect for so many years in WWF. And DDP kept saying how he was going to have a mystery partner to have him take on Macho Man and Scott Hall. Now, Scott Hall was tag team champion with Kevin Nash, but Kevin Nash was MIA. No one knew where he was. 
And they didn't really try to explain why uh, Macho Man and Scott Hall were going up against DDP uh, and a mystery opponent with the exception that, you know, Macho Man and DDP were feuding and Scott Hall is an NWO member. So, you know, two marquee guys uh, from the NWO taking on DDP. And uh, Kurt Henning walks out uh, at the beginning of the match when DDP is making his entrance. And then that's when we find out, boom, Kurt Henning is the... Uh, mystery partner for DDP so this Bash at the Beach 97 was actually Kurt Henning's first match in WCW uh, since leaving WWF as Mr. Perfect uh, this was an okay match uh, I expect I expected a little bit more honestly I, I didn't remember this match I didn't remember most of these matches with the exception of the Benoit Sullivan match that was the only one I remembered watching as a kid oh and the final match but we'll get to that in a bit um, but yeah, basically what happens at the end of it is uh, Kurt Henning, you know, he thinks DDP attacks him, which it was totally by accident. But so he causes DDP the match because he gets mad at DDP. And then everyone thinks, oh, maybe Kurt Henning's joining the NWO. But he actually doesn't. He just walks out and um, he actually ends up joining the Horsemen, uh, replacing Arn Anderson, who is retiring. Uh, but then shortly after that, when the Horsemen and the NWO are feuding, then Kurt Henning actually joins the NWO. Very weird. I don't know why they didn't just have Kurt Henning come in as the NWO to begin with, but that was all the rage. Guys coming in, are they going to join the NWO? And then, then joining the NWO. After a while, I got tired. But, so, but they never did anything with Kurt Henning in the NWO. I mean, he does have a stint as a U.S. heavyweight champion, but, you know, I, I don't really remember too much of of Kurt Henning's work in WCW. I remember a whole lot of Mr. Perfect in WWF, but Kurt Henning, I, I felt like he never really made as big as an impact as he did in WWF. But you can say that about a lot of guys. Um, you know, Scott Hall, Macho Man, they're in prime heel form in this match, which is pretty good, but this is definitely not the highlight of the DDP Macho Man feud. Uh, for that, you could look to. Uh, DDP, Macho Man, and I believe Benoit or Raven, where they had a triple threat match. That was really good. Uh, but DDP and Macho Man would have so many great matches after this. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was their feud. I was excited to do this match, replaying this match, because it's a tag team match. And tag team matches are kind of hard to win in WCW NW Revenge. I mean, in all the games you know to begin with there i go i get the big flying elbow and ddp goes for the taunt <laughs> so he causes uh kurt henning the match in this one where in real life kurt henning caused him the match <laughs> but there you go macho man with the big flying elbow and ddp look at him he loved that one he loved it so much <laughs> he was given the taunt maybe he was you know taunted because he was uh, about to make his entrance to save Kurt Henning and he forgot, oh, it goes to a three count. I better get my ass in there. And uh, I get to win the match. So this match ends up going a lot shorter than I thought it would because sometimes tag team matches could drag out in WCW NW Revenge because the computer is so good at running in and breaking up your pin attempts. But right there, um, there you go. It's hubris, DDP. Next time, maybe don't taunt uh, when the enemy does something only when your partner does something good uh, maybe DDP is joining the NWO who knows you know maybe we'll have to find out next week if DDP is joining the NWO uh, the aftermath of uh, the bash at the beach let's play but here I go I'm ranking in a lot of these matches I haven't been doing a lot of you know singles matches and tag matches getting to about the middle of all these um scores maybe one day I'll try to put up videos where I try to rank top scores and actually discuss how the ranking system breaks down I think I have a good idea and I think I've seen some like you know FAQs explaining you know what moves equal how many points and this and that I've never really sat down to figure out the science so maybe down the line I'll do that but right now we're coming into the main event so the pay-per-view is almost over and the big highlight the big big you know marquee match oh wait no actually real quick before that Roddy Piper took on Ric Flair I almost forgot about that match it was an okay match uh, but Ric Flair was another one that a lot of people were wondering why wasn't he in revenge well he actually was in WCW most of 97 and uh, in 98 he wrestled all the way up until April of 98 
uh, but he was engaged with a lawsuit with Eric Bischoff and WCW. Uh, you know, he had no showed some dates claiming that WCW owed him money. Eric Bischoff wanted to fire him. There was a big lawsuit. So he was taken off of camera. They stopped selling his merchandise. They stopped talking about him on TV. They couldn't do anything. So that's why he was removed from the game because from that time, uh, from you know May of 98 uh, up until September of 98, uh, Ric Flair was not a part of the company, but in September of 98 He did return they had settled out of court. So whatever had to be settled got settled uh, Ric Flair probably got the money. He thought he was owed and um, Yeah, he returned restarted the horseman and all was fine But unfortunately Ric Flair does not make appearance in WCW and W revenge and that's like one of the really big glaring you know um, Missing wrestlers from this game is Ric Flair. Ric Flair was in WCW versus NWO World Tour, um, but you know, I, you know, Revenge is the better of the two games, and it would have been nice to see Ric Flair in the game. Unfortunately, you had that whole legal issue, so you could blame Eric Bischoff on that one. <laughs> Much like a lot of things that went wrong in WCW, you can blame Eric Bischoff. But nonetheless, the big main event for Bash at the Beach '97 was the tag team match between Lex Luger and the Giant against Hollywood Hogan and Dennis Rodman. That's right, Dennis Rodman making his in-ring debut at Bash at the Beach 97. This was the talk of the town. I did remember this as a kid growing up, um, being very interested yet confused as to why a basketball player for a team that I actually enjoyed because I was a fan of the Chicago Bulls as a kid. Why is he going to be in in wrestling? But this was sort of like the beginnings of, you know, these famous celebrities sort of dipping their toes in wrestling and, and bringing sort of the mainstream press and media. I mean, how else do you top or try to top Hogan turning his back on everyone one year later? Well, you bring in some personality like Dennis Rodman who was always having the cameras on him outside of basketball because of his you know what's eccentric personality let's say and um, it was just it was just a match made in heaven really it, it did a great business for um, the pay-per-view actually if you look at the numbers I was looking at these stats earlier um, Bash at the Beach 97 uh, you know it's sold out it sold out the arena, uh, but it was in 325 homes that had purchased the pay-per-view, and that was 75,000 more than had purchased the pay-per-view when the Outsiders, you know, created the NWO with Hogan. So even though that was a big attraction, you know, Nash and Hall coming to WCW and who was it going to be their mystery opponent at Bash of the Beach 96 and eventually the NWO would be formed. I mean, obviously no one really knew it was going to be Hogan, but still one year later, they were able to bring in 75,000 more buy rates for their pay-per-views. That's pretty big. Um, and you got to believe it was because, you know, of Dennis Rodman. People wanted to see Dennis Rodman in the ring. And now I don't remember, I didn't remember like how the actual met went match went down as a kid so when I rewatched the match I was actually pretty surprised how well Dennis Rodman carried himself in the ring I mean obviously he was no technical savant but he you know he had his arm drags and his leapfrogs and he's very athletic naturally because of his time being a world champion basketball player but he was great as being a heel of course he had the psychology down he knew how to take his time the fans were eating it up because it took him a good like five minutes to get in the match and he was milking it he was biding his time to get into the match and then when he got into the match he was so flamboyant so you know uh, just so in your face just like how you would expect Dennis Rodman to be and it was great and he sold extremely well I mean every bump he took looked like he was in so much pain like it, it was fantastic it made you wonder in another life Dennis Rodman could have been this great wrestler you know maybe he just went down a different path you know, basketball was his calling but what, what if basketball never worked out Dennis Rodman probably could have been a wrestler I mean because he was holding his own in a match where you had Hogan Luger and and the giant these are WCW's biggest stars at the time and the and Luger was hot Luger was hot at the time and he actually would um you know this was a time when Hulk Hogan was the WCW world champion so Bash at the Beach 96 he joins NWO a month later 
he beats the giant for the world title at hog wild and he's had the title all this time so we've we've gone almost a year with hulk hogan as the wcw champion after he turned his back on wcw and spray painting everyone spray painting the title uh so people are sick and tired of hogan they hate hogan and luger was seen as the guy as the savior of wcw under sting because sting was still doing the whole thing where he was you know in the in the rafters playing the whole crow gimmick but luger was the guy in the ring that people were gravitating towards he was the defender of wcw he was betrayed by hogan in that match along with sting macho man had turned uh the giant actually briefly turned he joined the NWO after that Hog Wild match, uh, but then would get kicked out like around December of 96. So that's why you have the Giant and Luger teaming up because the Giant thought by joining the NWO, he would still get his fair shake and Hogan would still give him an opportunity to face him for the title. Uh, but Hogan didn't want to. Hogan didn't want to pass up his spot. Um, so that caused Giant to fall, you know, out of favor with the NWO. So that, you know, that many months of that led up to this match. Um, and, you know, at the end of it, uh, it's very weird. The ending is very weird. And I, I think that's the one thing keep holding this match back. <laughs> With the exception of Dennis. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong. I, go watch this match and, and tell me that you didn't like Dennis Rodman's performance. I mean, I think everyone did, did their role. They did it very well in this match. The fans were eating it up. It was a very entertaining match. I mean, that's part of the beauty of wrestling. That's why I love wrestling because, yeah, you can have those technically sound, great matches to watch where it's all about ability. You know, we had that with Ultimo Dragon and Chris Jericho at the beginning of the pay-per-view. But you also need these matches. You need these matches with these big stars who know how to work a crowd, who know how to tell a story. And, yeah, they're not doing backflips. They're not doing hurricanas. They're not doing you know, all these fancy moves, but they're still telling a story. And there's great storytelling being done in this match. And that's why I loved it. And and Dennis Rodman performed better than I expected. Even 18 years later, re-watching it, uh, I remember watching it as a kid, but I didn't remember the details. I still remembered he was there. I still remembered he would show up a year later at, uh, you know, uh, Bash at the Beach 98 teaming with um, Hogan to go up against DDP and Carr Malone. So you still remember him because they told their story well. They got the job done. And uh, But at the end of this match, it's very weird. So Sting, quote-unquote Sting, I'm doing air quotes, but you can't see it, so I got to do a quote-unquote Sting, comes out, and it's Kevin Nash. It's obviously Kevin Nash because he's a giant <laughs> dressed up as Sting. Um, and when he gets into the ring, he steps over the ropes right about when the Giants about to choke slam Dennis Rodman. Uh, Kevin Nash, as Sting comes in, hits the Giant with the bat, hits him really hard too. Uh, and Giant falls out, and then he, he gets out and he leaves. So that leaves Luger in the ring alone. Uh, the ref's been knocked out by Rodman. Uh, and the, the announcers are like playing it off like, oh my god, it's Sting, it's Sting, it's not Sting. He's as tall as a giant. He steps over the ropes. Like, really? You can't see it? Uh, but I don't know. I guess later on in Nitro, you know, the next night or whatever, it would be revealed that Nash was, was the Sting imposter. And that would lead into the the Nash and the giant feud because the Nash was ju ducking giant and stuff like that. Anyway, you would think, okay, he interfered and now Hogan and Rodman win, but Lex Luger puts Hogan in the torture rack he puts Rodman in the torture rack first, and then he puts uh, Hogan in the torture rack, and another ref comes in, sees that Hogan taps out, and then Luger wins the match. So, why Nash interfered, uh, and then Luger and Giant still wins? I don't know. And then also, the pay-per-view ends with the camera on a defeated Rodman and Hogan and Macho Man, because Macho Man was floating around uh, the ring the whole match. Um, I don't know why, he just took one bump off the off the rope at one point he didn't really do anything in the match uh but the camera ends on them leaving defeated very weird ending the focus was on the losers uh my, you should have just made them win uh that would have made the you know what would happen a couple of weeks later on nitro even more sweeter when um, lex luger beats hulk hogan for the world title on the episode of Light nitro and I, I think that was my biggest takeaway from this bash bash at the beach is that it really did set up Luger being the first guy to take the title away from Hogan and I remember that vividly 
that was a huge moment for me. Uh, I think we were all waiting. We were all waiting to see who would it be. And when you know Lex Luger made Hogan tap at the end of Bash at the Beach, we all knew it was possible. And then he would get his opportunity. He would face Hogan on Nitro on August 4th, 1997. And he would make uh, Hulk Hogan tap. Hogan obviously cried foul. And um, that would lead right into the Hog Wild pay-per-view August 9th. Uh, but Hogan would get the title back because, you know, NWO, they cheat, y yada, yada, yada. But still, it was a great moment, and I guess that was the one thing I remember the most from that, from this pay-per-view is um, the lead-in to Luger being the, um, the the shining moment that, yes, WCW could defeat the big bad NWO. It is possible one year later, um, and then it would happen again with Sting, but Luger was the first, and even though I was never, I'm, you know, I was never really a big big fan of Luger I definitely was behind him um, when he was trying to beat Hulk Hogan now this match is going on quite long because unfortunately when I play as Luger in WCW and WWE Revenge I don't like playing as him because it's so hard to win with the torture rack only because I feel like every time you put someone in the torture rack no matter what your positioning is in the ring they're gonna get to the ropes very quickly so at this point we're going almost 10 minutes and I'm thinking man I just gotta put this guy away but Hogan's got a comeback special he's countering damn near everything I'm throwing at him which is making it difficult to, for me to even do like grapple moves I'm trying to limit my striking moves because as you can see even when I strike him his meters going up uh, I, I kind of wish you know he you know when you put someone up in the torture rack he didn't move as much but Another thing that I was thinking of, like, why wasn't Dennis Rodman put in the game? Uh, probably, obviously, because of licensing. They probably didn't want to pay for Dennis Rodman's um, image. But you see Eric Bischoff over there in the back. He came in as a manager to Hulk Hogan. When you do singles matches, some guys come out as managers. And uh, Eric Bischoff is in the game. Uh, but there's a lot of managers that come out that aren't selectable characters in the game. Dusty Rhodes is one of them. Um, you also have... Who do you have? You have Dusty Rose, you have Rick Rude, you have Virgil, or Vincent, as he was known in WCW. Um, so you have a couple of guys there that their models are in the game, but they're not selectable wrestlers. But uh, Eric Bischoff is, which is pretty shocking because Eric Bischoff wrestled like two matches in WCW, before, you know, around, you know, no, one, he, mess, he wrestled one match, I should say, in WCW before... Uh, Revenge came out, and that was against Larry Sabisco at Starcade 97, and then he would wrestle at Road Wild 98 against Hogan, uh, no, against DDP and Carl Malone with Hulk Hogan. So uh, Eric Bischoff was only in two matches, and they let him in the game, <laughs> but we didn't get the Vianos. Come on, <laughs> we didn't get the Vianos. Might as well just thrown in Dennis Rodman. You know, add insult to injury. Get have the team of Dennis Rodman and Eric Bischoff, but no Vianos. We don't get Viano four or five. Um, so you know what I'm gonna do now. After I finish recording this episode, I'm gonna go on WWE 2K15, and I'm gonna see if anyone has created the Vianos. And if no one's created the Vianos, I'm gonna have to make the Vianos, and I'm gonna do a let's play of WWE 2K15, and I'm gonna call it "Why weren't the Vianos in WCW and WWE Revenge?" <laughs> that's gonna be my goal that's my goal if we ever get out of this match between Hogan and Luger see this is like the worst situation you could be in because Hulk Hogan yeah he's making a comeback but he's not gonna beat you so it really is just like you have to do your best to try to just beat this guy because you can't you, you shouldn't lose to Hulk Hogan in revenge Hulk Hogan has one of the worst move sets in the game if Eric Bischoff was in the game I would say Hulk Hogan is the worst playable character in this game but Eric Bischoff is the worst playable character in this game because he can't grab with the guy he can only do his stupid kicks and in this game every time you strike the opponent their meter goes up so there's no point of playing as Eric Bischoff because when you're hitting the other guy you're boosting his special and then also when you're playing against Eric Bischoff, you know all he's gonna do is hit you, so you can just counter him for days. Worst character in the game. I mean, they purposely made him like that, but still. You know, you, you couldn't put the Vianos? All right, I'm gonna get off my Viano rack. But there I go, torture rack, get the rope break. So I go for a pin, thinking like, all right, maybe I could pin him. Kicks out, Hulkamania's hoking up. 
it's getting really difficult now. But uh, yeah, you can't lose to Hulk Hogan. His special is the old man flop, which is what Ric Flair had in WCW End of World World Tour, which I always thought was weird because he should have had like the, um, you know, where he sidewalk slams you down and then goes into your uh, leg grapple. But I don't know if they had that set up back then in that game. Uh, but still, they could have given Hogan a better move than that. I mean, Hogan was always built as this powerhouse wrestler, right? I mean, we all knew when we got older, you know, obviously as a kid, I didn't think, you know, I only thought the world of Hogan, but when I got older, I got to see uh, him for what he really was in terms of an in-ring talent. I still thought he was an amazing promo and a personality. Um, but, you know, he didn't have the greatest of moveset, but still, you could have given him some power moves or giving him a big slam as his special uh british bulldog has like this big body slam in the game that's carried over in some of some of the later games why did they give hogan that he was always making a big deal out of like slamming the big guys like the giant or kevin nash uh, you could have given him that or actually, or given him something where he does a slam and then he does like a big leg drop. They never incorporated the leg drop as one of his finishers and that's like what he's kind of known for, right? I mean, you could just do a standing leg drop, but it's not like you're going to win a lot of matches with it. But here I go, Lex Luger, I choke Hulk Hogan out. You know, I wasn't going to stay there and try to build up my special again because we would have been here till Bash of the Beach 98. Uh, I could review that whole pay-per-view, but so I hope you enjoy this. The Bash at the Beach '97 memories. Try to do as many matches as I can. I'm gonna do some more, uh, you know, pay-per-view reflection videos. But I thought this would be a great time to do Bash at the Beach because today, as I record, is the 18-year anniversary of that pay-per-view. WCW NW Revenge came out in October of '98, 17 years ago. Time flies when you're having fun playing wrestling games. And uh, so if you like this video, go ahead and click that like button. Subscribe if you want to know when my next videos launch. And uh, leave comments. Tell me what, what, what your favorite memories of Bash at the Beach 97 were. Or if you, know, you thought 96, 98, whichever. Or any other pay-per-views. Let me know. I love reading the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you next time. Keep, keep watching wrestling. And um, I'll see you around. Thank you.